Shalom Achim. Uh, my son is here with me, Ethan, and uh, he just wanted to tell everybody hello. Hi. So, God bless you, and we'll start in just a second. Okay, Achim. Um, Achim, slicha. Uh, my brothers, we are, we are, I want to take you to the book of Ruth. Uh, this is for my Jewish brethren that are listening out at this video that follow. Uh, some of these teachings, and I realize that many of you have to do this in secret. It's quite all right. I understand. And, uh, but this is going to bring some insight. Uh, just for a little background, I'm, I know there, there's many rabbinical uh, scholars, uh, teachers as well, that know the Christian people look at the story of Ruth and Boaz and Naomi as a type of, of Christ, as a kinsman redeemer. And... I'm, I'm not here to argue that, but I'm here to bring out some points that even the Christian scholars have never considered before. And for us as Jews, it will help us to better understand the identity of, the, uh, of Moshiach ben David when he comes. Now, Boaz, keep in mind, happens to be the great, uh, what would it be, the great, great grandfather of David because we find out later in the story, Ruth, she gives uh, birth to Obed, and Obed gives birth to Jesse, who happens to give birth to David. It's through the lineage there. And yet, it's kind of interesting, because I have brought out to you before, that the uh, Moshiach ben David is the seed of the woman, has to be as it is. It has to be through a woman, so therefore the lineage through David is going to be through Mary, uh, in, in the case of the story of Joseph and Mary, when Jesus is born, and we look at the two different genealogies that are, that are, that are placed up there, and uh, Hashem actually takes it back through Mary's side because he would have to, because he already says in, in uh, Genesis that the seed, uh, 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 talking about the woman's seed and the serpent seed, and the woman's seed would bruise the head of the serpent's uh, seed. So anyway, you have to watch the, the video, uh, actually part two of Moshiach, uh, um, uh, uh, Judaism versus Christianity, uh, the son of David. Let's take the book of Ruth, though. Let's quickly try to go through this. There's a lot of ground to cover. It says here, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab and he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was uh, Elimelech. Uh, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Mahalon and Kilion, uh, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, uh, Judah, and they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Kind of an interesting uh, look at this right here. The whole story of Ruth foreshadows you know, even if you take it from Christianity's point of view that Jesus is a type of Boaz, there's a lot more hidden in there than what you could ever imagine. It's not just a type maybe of Jesus in his earthly ministry. This story is going to actually prophesy prophetically of the events of the future as well. And that's what I'm wanting to bring out to you guys. I can see here plainly in the very beginning a very type and shadow of Israel going into exile. And, uh, and, and not speaking of the exile necessarily of the house of Israel, even though he is a, a, an, an Ephrathite or an Ephraimite, we, we would say, uh, from the tribe of Ephraim, but it's, it's speaking of even the house of Judah going into exile. And I think you'll see where I'm coming from in just a second here. It says, Then uh, Elimelech, uh, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And keep in mind, they're in Moab a foreign land, a Gentile land. Going into verse 4, now they took wives, this is the sons of uh, Chilion and Machalon, um, they, took, they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Oprah, and the name of the other Ruth, Orpah, excuse me, not Oprah, Ortha, uh, and Ruth. And they dwelt there about 10 years. Uh, then both Mahalon and Kileon also died, so the woman survived her two sons and her husband, talking about um, Naomi at that point there. By the way, the word Naomi means pleasant, um, is what uh, Naomi's name actually means, just for you that don't know it. And the word, uh, the name Ruth uh, means companion, so kind of interesting. Keep those things in your mind there as we go on. Verse 6 there, then she arose... Um, 
uh, so I'm talking about Naomi, with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. We're starting now to see the return of Israel coming back to their homeland, God giving them back a place in Palestine. It's interesting when, when we look at this, you know, you might think, how does the bread, a lot of times we look at bread as being the word of God, and yes, that is true as well. But also we know that when Jesus was teaching in his ministry, he said to his, uh, his, his followers, his students, he said, look around, the fields are, are ripe and ready for harvest. And he told them, he said, go into the fields. They're, 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 we need plenty of laborers. We need people to reap. And he's actually speaking of, the, the, he's referring to the field and the, and, 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 the, and the barley there, that that is people. And to reap the harvest is what he speaks of there. So just a thought for my Jewish brethren that may not know that. This is why I'm kind of leaning towards this. So he, anyway, it says, he visited by the people giving them bread. Therefore, she went out from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law went with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Now, both daughters start out, but we're going to find that one doesn't go all the way. And it's the same thing with Israel. Today, the, the return to Israel it, in the beginning, it was a mass exodus of the Jews coming from all over the world, especially after the Holocaust, back to, to Israel. But then many of them, though, they, just, they didn't want to go. They end up going to the U.S. They go to other countries. Some of them stayed in Europe. Not everybody wants to go. It's the same way with the exodus with Moses. Not everyone came out of Egypt. As, as many of our rabbi brethren have said, they, some of them, you know... <laughs> Thousands and thousands stayed behind because now that the Egyptians are dead, they figured they could take over the place. But that wasn't what God had intended. God wanted to deliver Israel and to go and to, to go to the promised land. Uh, so as, let's, let's kind of move on, though. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go return each to her mother's house. And the Lord return each uh, to okay. And, and the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. And the Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So that he, so she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will we will return with with you to your people. Now we know the story. Um, Orpah doesn't. She's, she's not as fully convinced, so she doesn't go back. She doesn't go, but Ruth, is, is she's steadfast. She doesn't care what anybody has to say. She's going to stay right there with Naomi. Keep this in mind, Christian people, because Ruth, you are a type of Ruth standing with Israel. Naomi, you're standing with her, and you will not... You won't forsake her, regardless of what things look like, you won't forsake her. Because Ruth knows they're going back to Israel. Yes, there's bread in the land, but the problem is they, they have nothing, you know. Eli uh, Melech, uh, he has already, he sold what they had, so they have no possession. Uh, so, but she's not going to give up. Let's skip down just a little bit here. Um, Let's go down to verse uh, verse 15, and because uh, we know this is what happens there. And she said, look, uh, your sister-in-law has gone back. Now Naomi's wanting to get Ruth to, to go ahead and, and, you know, don't worry about me, just go. Uh, to her people and her gods and returned after your sister-in-law. But Ruth says, entreat me not, leave, uh, not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. My brothers, sisters, especially in the Christian community, keep that close in mind. Here this is a woman that is from a Gentile nation that believes in multiple gods to begin with. And now she's embracing Naomi, and she is admitting and, and saying that her, her, Naomi's God is going to be her God. And Naomi's God happens to be Hashem. It's Yahweh or, or Yahweh, however you want to say that in English. Um, but so she says her God is going to be her God. 
And then in verse 17, where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also of anything but death parts you and me. That's a great thing. I would rather die than to deny the God of Israel. Flat out, much rather do it. Um, and, and that's the way uh, Ruth had became as well. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, this is Naomi uh, in this case here, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them, and the woman said, um, and the, excuse me, and the women said, is this Naomi? Uh, but she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Don't call me pleasant. Uh, call me Mara, which is bitter. You know, it's, it's bitterness. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. It, it, you know, this is what the Jewish people, when they came back to Israel, you have to remember, there were Jews in Israel. And that's exactly what these women represent here. There, there were Jews in Israel when the, when the exodus from the different parts of the world began back in the uh, 40s after, after the Holocaust. There were Jews already there. And when they seen their brethren coming home, they were excited to see them. But the problem was, even though Israel is a pleasant people, a godly people, they, 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 they were coming with sorrow because why? They had suffered tragedy and death. One in six Jews, or no, excuse me, maybe I got that around backwards. Six million Jews in the Holocaust died. I think if I remember right, the estimate was there was like 10 million Jews, you know, that were there in Europe at the time. And here, Naomi has suffered more loss than, you know, her, her husband, her sons, and she's the only one alive. And, and she feels like God has looked upon her like all this has happened because of her. And it's not the case. But the, nonetheless, she comes back and she feels bitter, you know, that, you know, that, that, that she should be looked upon because God had felt like she, God had dealt her a bad hand. And it's the way it is with the Jewish people today. We, 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 come, we came home, but it's been a hard bitterness. You know, I, I didn't live during that time. My family come to the United States illegally, so, you know, before the Holocaust. So, but nonetheless, we have names on the Yad Vashem of, of family member after family member after family member, but they're distant to me, so I, I can't personally feel the tragedy as much as those Jews that came out of the Holocaust that were there and seen it and were a part of it. But no doubt, when they went to the homeland, you know, it, it was wonderful to go home, but it was bitter as well. Because how could this happen? So, anyhow, let's, let's go ahead and, and, and move on now. In verse 20, But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. And that, oh my God, there's so much truth in the Jewish people when they look at the, 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 the scattering of Israel in 70 AD, the Jewish people still to this day scratch their heads and question, how could this have happened? But my brethren, we have to be honest with ourselves and say, if we have been scattered as a nation, there's a reason. If our people were scattered, no time in biblical history did God ever scatter our people without it being for sin. And the only thing that anybody could really equate to Titus coming in and destroying Israel had to have something to do in the time frame of when the Gospels uh, of Jesus' apostles as they spread through. We have to look at the, the, the story, the case of Daniel. Daniel prophesies and he says to us in the ninth chapter that Messiah is to come and he'll be cut off. It's, it's written in the Talmud that the Messiah, that before the destruction of the second temple, Messiah should be cut off. So it shouldn't be a strange thing to us that the Messiah be cut off. Even Jesus himself, don't think he didn't know it. He says it to his apostles that he had to suffer and die. He knew it before it happened. 
And even when he reads Yeshayahu, Hanavi, he, he, he quotes from uh, 61, Isaiah 61, but he quotes from verse 1 and half of verse 2, which only applies to Moshiach's part of his ministry. The, the second half is the, what, what, what uh, like Rabbi Misrahi, what he looks at is, he says when the Messiah comes, it's supposed to, everything's supposed to be wonderful. It will be wonderful, but not at the first part. What about Psalm 22? Dehalim. You know, we, we, cannot, we cannot say that he was supposed to have a flower bed of ease when David himself cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They, they spit upon me. They pierced my hands and my feet. David's hands and feet were never pierced. So we have to take a serious look at the prophetic words that were there. Now, I, I've seen the argument to say that Jesus never said that Israel would return. It's nonsense. He said, when the fig tree put forth her branches, know that even summer is nigh. And we know Israel is, is a fig tree. Jesus knew it. He's a Jew. He knows it. Talking about when we'd become a nation. So, and, but he says, you know, your house is left desolate until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. That's not talking about us being a nation. He's talking about the house. You, we have to remember when he says house, he doesn't in the way we think of house. He's not talking about Israel as a nation because he even says about the temple, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. He's talking about his body. And the temple, Rabbi uh, Or, does not Rabbi Or say that the temple is laid out like the human body and he says that the, that the soul or the heart, the human heart, is where the Holy of Holies is and it's a representation uh, for the Shekinah for the Kadosh to live inside of us. Ruach Kadosh, the Holy Spirit. So, my brethren, we really have got to take a serious look at this. And the book of Ruth, I'm reading this yesterday and this morning. I started to do a video. I had to redo it because there's so much here. Um, let's, go, let's go ahead and on. In verse uh, 21, I went out full and the Lord brought me again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? You know, in Hebrew, that, that's a normal word for us. Naomi, why do you call me pleasant? Since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. Say, Naomi returned and Ruth and the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. And that, that my brothers, here we are, the Christian people believe, and I, when I say this, understand, I, I, I believe it, I support it. We're living in an hour where, as they call it, the coming of Moshiach is at hand. For them, it's the second time. We're looking for Moshiach. We're gathered in our homeland, and it's at the time of harvest. The Christian scholars and ministers believe that we're living in the hour when Mashiach ben David is to come, and for them is to come to catch away a bride. And that's what they look at the story of Boaz about. It's a marriage. But I'm going to show you as Christians some things you haven't looked at that Boaz says, because Boaz prophesies in here. Chapter 2. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth of the family of uh, Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I might find favor. When, you know when the Gentiles were here, they came to Jesus they saw something in him. The Roman soldier comes to him. I, this is a little, maybe a little side thought here. Even the, the name uh, Machalom, uh, Ruth's actual husband, who dies, and boy, is now he's going to take that place. He's going to raise up his name. And but Machalom, his name means sick in Hebrew. Now that's kind of interesting in itself because Jesus' ministry was to the sick. I don't, you know. <laughs> It gets, it gets better and better all the time. 
So that Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, uh, please let me go to the field and glean the heads of grain after him in whose sight I might find favor. And, he, and she said to her, go my daughter. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she reaped, uh, she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of uh, Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz uh, came from uh, Bethlehem. Of course, I mean, that's the obvious thing for the Christian. You know, Jesus was, uh, was, was born in Bethlehem. So um, the house of bread, the house of God's bread, and said to the reapers, now what, this is, this is critical here. Now this, the Christian people, it's critical for you, for the Jewish people, it will help you as my brethren to recognize that Moshiach is Yahweh, Yahweh, in a human body. My brother, keep in mind as you watch this here, when Moshe met uh, Malach at the burning bush, Eish Sinai, he met Malach is Elohim, it's Elohim, it's God manifesting himself in another way. In, in the Shekinah, in the Eish Sinai, in the burning bush. And when the, when, 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 when the voice that speaks from the midst of the bush, it's Yahweh, it's Hashem speaking right to Moses. It's what it says in the middle. I brought out a video recently, it should have been an obvious sign when the Romans put that thorn bush on the head of Jesus, they should have known that they were putting, when they put it on his head and he spoke out in that unknown tongue, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was the flesh side of Jesus that was crying out. But the thing was, was it was in the midst of the thorn bush was Hashem. Inside of that human body was the Spirit of Almighty God waiting to come out of Him in order to come back upon us. The reason why we've offered our sacrifices for all these years to begin with was, to, was for an atonement for sin. But the problem is, is if we had the life of the animal come back upon us, then we'd act like the animal. Of course, a lamb would be, God wants a gentleness of spirit, so he uses a lamb as, as a type for that. And it's always clean animals, it's never unclean. But we have to ask ourselves then, when the temple is destroyed and we're not able to offer sacrifices in the, in the provided place that God chose to put his name, then why is it then that our fathers that have died since then are in another realm that are crying out according to John in the book of Revelation, my God, how long do you avenge our blood? They're not dead. So something has atoned for their sin and we have not offered a sacrifice for the sins of Israel. So we have to ask our question this, not to mention, why, why did Moshiach have to come and die in the first place? He had to die. He had to because Adam and Eve forsakes the spirit of Almighty God that they had in the Garden of Eden. By the sin itself, they forfeit because God had breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and he became a, for, for, it says, la nefesh chayim, for his soul was the life of Yahweh. And he becomes a living soul. And when he breathes in his nostrils, he said, this, the Hebrew says, he breathed chayim, plural life. This is why when he, when he takes and he, he splits Adam in half and he takes half his side and he makes Eve. He doesn't have to breathe into her nostrils the breath of life because he taken from Ish. He taken from the man and the Ish, as you know, comes from the Hebrew word fire, Ish, fire, and the divine letter Yod, right in the middle of that, God's own life is there. He takes that from Adam because he's already put Chaim in him, Chaim, the life is there so he can impart eternal life into his wife. He doesn't have to breathe into her again. But she's able to bring forth children. This is why Adam calls her later, later Chava. And Chava, there's no Yod in there. Why? Because Yahweh now, the spirit of Yahweh is missing. 
So he can't call her, call her, uh, uh, he cannot use the word Chaim at that point there because now she can bring forth life, but not eternal life, the life of Hashem that's supposed to be dwelling inside of our heart. No wonder why Jesus says a body has to, you know, is, 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 God does not want to dwell in temples made with hands. He said, a body hast thou made me. And that body was for Hashem to come and get inside of a human body in order to re-impart eternal life. This is why there had to be a virgin. And I know, I know the debate, Alma. Alma doesn't mean virgin. But nonetheless, Isaiah says, a young maiden shall bring forth a child and his name shall call, be called Emmanuel. God is with us because God is in the human body. So, I mean, I, I realize, Christians, this may be tough for you because I'm going in areas that Jews can understand and it's to try to open up eyes. So please, please bear with me here when I, when I say this here because this is where we're at here. We're in verse 4, chapter 2. Because see, now, now uh, behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, those that are supposed to be bringing in the harvest, okay, the Lord be with you. In Hebrew, Yahweh Imcha. That literally means Jehovah is with you. He's prophesying of the coming of the Messiah in his own words because he's a type of the Messiah. And he tells them, literally in English, maybe where Christians can understand it, Jehovah is with you. Because he walked in the room. He walked into the field. He's telling the reapers. He's letting them know that when Mashiach comes, Mashiach is going to have Yahweh inside of him and it'll be Yahweh with you. That's why Yeshayahu says that, uh, that she shall bring forth a son and he shall call his name Emmanuel. No wonder why he's called Er Gibor. There's not two gods. It's one God. Hmm. So Boaz is prophesying. Then Boaz, now watch, they, they say here, and they answered him, Yahweh bless you. Yahweh bless you. Hashem bless you. See? You didn't have to say that. They didn't say, uh, Yahweh imcha. No. And he says, Yahweh imchem to them. Jehovah is with you. He's with you. And he wants to be in you. That's what, that's what made the relationship with Adam and Eve so close to God's heart was he was living inside of them. He had fellowship one-on-one -on -one with them face to face and could come down in the cool of the day and enjoy their presence. But that was lost. It got forfeited in the Garden of Eden. And it, yes, you know, it started with Eve, but Adam knew good and well what he was doing and so he forfeited it the worst. This is why God says, to, to the, when he says to the serpent, you know, I will put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. See, the woman has to have a seed. In other words, there's got to be a woman that will believe what God's word says. And when she doesn't doubt it, God can recreate another child in the womb. Because now the process of birth has changed. But God has already said to Yeshayahu in Isaiah 43, 42, 44, you look at all those chapters there, I have created him, yea, I have formed him. Talking about Moshiach. Not the one that speaks about Israel, he's talking about Moshiach. And he says, Anihu, I am he. Mm. It's tough. It, you know, my brothers, sisters, if you're a Christian watching this, this is not skim milk. This is not something that's just easy for you to take. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. All right, uh, we, we, we got this. Let's, let's go on to verse 5. Then Boaz said to his servants who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? Who is this young woman? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and he said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from the morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. You know, 
according to Levitical law, chapter 23, verse 22, God commanded in our, in, through, through the law of Moses that when we grow a field, we're to leave the four corners untouched. You ever wonder why? The other day when I released a video about the, uh, he also told us to put uh, it's, it's, it's a tzitzit on the four corners, it's the, the knots, the little, the little braids, you see it in the Orthodox Jewish community, I, I, I have one as well, and it was the reminder of the law, that we're to, to remember the law of Moses, the law to keep that in our minds day and night, you know, and it's true, if you ever wear one, uh, your hands are always touching it, you, you cannot help but think of God unless you're of the business class and they tend to tuck them into their pants where they don't feel nothing. But the whole purpose for that is for remembrance. And I said to you that I believe that it was also showing that the law of God said, and um, oh gosh, uh, I believe it's Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 12, that he would return the house of Judah and the house of Israel again. It was a promise by Hashem and God was having us pray it every single day that we would return. Not just remember, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not bear false witness but that God would return our people. That's part of his law as well. And the four corners that were left, they were left for the stranger, according to the Levitical law. For the poor and for the stranger, the alien, the Gentile, to, to go out. And as Jesus said himself in his teaching, he's speaking of the barley harvest, or the wheat harvest, whatever they had, barley, the way it was in Jerusalem, you know, the fields are ripe, but there's not enough reapers. Pray ye the Lord that he'll send more into the field. That is speaking also, he left those corners, it's representing Israel. The Christian people that have been a part in working with the Jews to bring home the lost tribes of Israel and the lost house of Judah back to the promised land who have done it faithfully and not, not, with, the, with, with this ideological idea in their mind that we're going to get them, Archers is going to get the Jews to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. The Baptists, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Catholics, or whatever it might be. Nonsense! Just stand with them. God will reward your labor of love when you, when you hook yourself up with the Jewish people to bring back with no motive, no ill gain, just because your desire and love for Israel is there, there is a blessing that goes with it. That's one reason why the nation of America has been blessed. Not because of all.